After 12 manic weeks of bluffing, backstabbing, superstar egos, and transatlantic rivalry, Live Aid Day finally dawned. Everyone was on tenterhooks. Television was still in the Stone Age, and no one had ever done anything like this before. 58 bands, live, over 16 hours, with a temperamental revolving stage and 13 satellites. Would it work? Would anyone watch? And more importantly, would the punters put their hands in their pockets? much sleep. Paula had put towels under the sheet because I, I, I had that phenomenon of cold sweat. I was just pacing and I was on the phone quite a lot still. And I was trying to put off leaving. That's the truth. That, that's right this second what I remember. It's just suddenly a blast of that. I remember opening the curtains and seeing a sunny day. And I think it was one of the few or maybe the only sunny day that summer. And I thought, wow, something's happening. The magnitude of the day ahead was just beginning to dawn on the reluctant BBC boys fronting the show. I don't really get to sleep, to be honest. Um, I can remember kind of getting up, certainly, at about 5 o'clock and going for a walk by the river. And at 6 o'clock, the phone went. It was Andy Kershaw, uh, my old mate, who lived around the corner. He said, hey, Mark, have you got your brown trousers on? <laughs> and I remember being absolutely sick with fear, waiting for the BBC car to come and pick me up. And I lived in Chiswick in those days. And the car had already picked up Mark Allen. And even Mark's uh, <laughs> relentless uh, joshing and wonderful sense of humour in the car up to Wembley couldn't really... Uh, make me lighten up. But nobody else wanted to miss out. Even Live Aid's toughest press critic, the NME, sent a solitary hack. Yeah, I remember getting the tube train up to North London, and of course all the carriages were packed with um, people going to Live Aid, and it struck me this wasn't a typical concert-going audience of the kind that I was used to from the 70s and the 80s. This wasn't a rock audience as such, this really was Middle England. Shorts and t-shirts and big bags yeah, yeah. full of drinks yeah. and two sandwiches, litres. just in case we died of starvation <laughs> in London. Yeah. Definitely two litres of weak orange squash, I vividly we remember that, with a handle. <laughs> Everybody was nice. <laughs> Nobody was going to be horrible to each other. You could just feel that. Everybody was smiling. I, I, you know, everybody was just terribly excited. At ten o'clock, the dam burst. And Ali just went, run! <laughs> we all ran across Wembley Stadium. It was just, it was awesome, it was absolutely awesome just to get in there and see all the stage set up and just a fantastic feeling. While the fans staked out their turf, just across the river, a massive airlift was getting underway. Jason, you three many persons on board and you're fine. The stars were in the air and their pilot was TV presenter Noel Edmonds. There was no space to land helicopters at Wembley and the nearest spot that we could find was the other side of the tube line where there is a cricket pitch. The first point of contact pointed out to us there was a very important cricket match on that day. 
And we said, well, it's Live Aid. The world is watching. This is the only place that we can land. I said, but it's a very important cricket match we've got. This, this could only happen in this country. So all these guys in their whites, you know, sort of ready at the bat. And next thing you know, it was up with the stumps, this, in they ran, blah, blah, blah. Out came Bono in a car, Range Rover off, back in the stumps, where were we? You know, back on. I got there in a helicopter, yes, um, from my house in Windsor. Because of, uh, not being grand or anything like that, because I just thought the fucking traffic would be a nightmare. Elton was going through a particularly interesting period um, in the follicle department. And it was pointed out that when he arrived at Wembley, the rotors of the helicopter had to be stationary <laughs> for fear that the draft could cause the Elton rug to become detached. He was very worried about his wig. However, on the day, what he should have been concerned about was his garden. I wasn't too happy because we just planted some things at the garden and the, the helicopter um, took off and, and more or less destroyed everything that we'd done in that summer trying to plant the, the, the things that we did. And the words that came out of Elton's mouth were just, my fucking begonias, I've just had them done. Others were enjoying a different kind of trip. I remember circling over the place in a helicopter. At least I think I was in a helicopter. <laughs> That's true. Uh, before we went on, and uh, obviously before we went on. And it was just such an amazing sight. I shall never forget that, over the stadium. It, it just looked so fantastic. <laughs> looking down into a, a sea of mullets. I think I even had one myself back then. They were very popular. Uh, and that just, that crackle of anticipation. At 10 minutes to 12, and the time is now 13 minutes to 12, on the two big screens to the side of the stage, the world. 72,000 people sweltered in the baking heat. I find it incredible that the sort of the mass of people probably feel that something should be done, yet their own governments just don't do anything. They do very little. You know, the very fact that it has to be done by people giving their own money is, is ridiculous. I mean, we've given enough money into government, why can't they spend some of our money giving it back? Perfectly honest, we were into the music scene. <laughs> and um, okay, it was a good cause, but I don't think at that age we maybe should have been, but our first priority was having a good time in the music. Backstage, nobody seemed to know what was going on. There were a lot of people walking about in clipboard, with clipboards and, and headphones and, and looking as though they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Which, of course, in hindsight, was that nobody knew what was going on at all. Uh, and it was full of, full of pop stars sort of looking quite vacant. The words of wisdom, let it be. What time is it? It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. At Christmas time. While the stars tuned up, Geldof was his usual manic self. When we got there, I, I saw him. He, he was uh, on a phone next to one of those huge trailers, and he was saying, Fuck off! No, stick it up your ass. And I thought, well, God, I wonder if it's the right time to say hello. So I, <laughs> I wandered up and I said, hi, Bobby. He went, oh, good, you're here. Hello, Pam, how you doing? Oh, good, I'm glad you're here, blah, blah, blah. And it's going great and tra-la-la. And I said, someday on your, on your back there. He said, ach! <laughs> Somebody wanted to put Santana on next. He said, they're fucking crap. <laughs> <laughs> this guy from the from the boomtown rats is telling me this and done our crap. I think not. Wrap your arms around the world yeah. at Christmas time. 
With all the chaos backstage, the production crew forgot all about the imminent arrival of the royal couple. It was a mad rush to hit the phones. You've got to come early. Why do I come early? I'm on at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. Amazingly, everyone came. Rock stars don't get up, do they? But no, if you see the footage, everyone's there. And everyone was there to meet Britain's most glamorous royal. And she got to me and, and my manager said, uh, this is Nick Kershaw. And she said, I know who he is. Which I was very pleased with. Yeah. <laughs> Princess Di said to her, didn't realise he was so short. I said, short, he's a fucking midget. She was completely flirtatious, actually. She was a real sort of, you know, homely. And I'm sure she said something of sort of slightly naughty extract. I seem to remember it was something to do with underwear or suspenders or something a little fruity. All these growing pop stars being completely jelly at Princess Diana at all or going, oh, you know, like schoolboys. While stars were being smitten, Television producers were racing against time to write the biggest introduction in television history. With seconds to go, I got a, a little voice in my earpiece saying, um, the royal party are not going on stage, they're going straight to the royal box, so you will have to do the opening. Oh, will we? He dictated to me with my hands, you know, and I wrote out these words, it's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia, um, read it to myself a couple of times quietly, gave a bit of voice lever on the microphone, and before you knew it, it was 30 seconds, good luck. And he started to read it, and he'd read the first two or three words when suddenly they switched the PA on in the stadium. It's 12 noon, and then it goes, it's 12 noon! It's 12 noon in London, 7 a.m. in Philadelphia. And around the world, it's time for Live Aid. And then there was this extraordinary moment where Richard and I just embraced each other and, f and cried. We were, we, were, we were both quite overcome. It was just kind of... <laughs> it started, we were all right. Geldof had chosen the opening act weeks earlier, but they weren't everyone's favourite vintage. Some chap says, who's opening the show? And uh, Bob went, well, it's obvious. Who's going to open the show? It's status quo. Working all over the world. And I went, oh, no. I'm not sure about that. Even in 1985, it seemed as if status quo had been around forever, doing exactly the same riff <laughs> over and over, wearing the same clothes. And it was behind me when the announcement was made that status quo were coming on first. And he just turned around and said, oh, fucking stand status quo. In all the years that we'd been together, even by then, by 85, um, you know, we weren't necessarily nervous before a gig, bit of nervous energy, but I was really cacking myself before we went out there, you know. Would you welcome status quo? Looking at the crowds just before they started the opening bars, you know, the hairs on the back of the neck were standing up. And I was standing there with Tony Hadley, who's about seven foot three, isn't it? And, um, and you could hear in your headphones, five, four, three, two, one. Down, 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 down. 